that wasn't just a solo, that was an experience. <laughs> Mr. President, and I pause. Because all the time I've been here, I have been thinking of that bright little boy in my congregation in Cleveland. Came from a noble family. His father, an elder of the church, extremely loyal, helpful, optimistic. His grandfather took care of that church. And then I sat there and kept thinking, Mr. President, it's a pleasure. My brethren, sisters, saints of God, my wife and I feel extremely blessed that at my age, we're still able to enjoy things like this. And I want to tell you that since we arrived, I haven't seen or felt anything quite like this in a long time. Thank the Lord. I have been accused of choosing peculiar sermon titles. I don't do it deliberately, it just happens. And the title for today, a special kind of service, and I believe a special kind of message, the title is really a gentle supplication. You'll have to hear it in my voice. The title is A Little Orthodoxy, Please. Now, I don't mind telling you that I have had a lot of assignments the first half of this year, but none has caused the struggle in my head that this one has caused. I asked them to send me the biographies of these men. I read about them. Before I had seen them, I pictured them in my head. And I asked the Lord to make them special. and make this service memorable. Let me start with a story. I had been asked to preach at a very large church. It was Senior's Day. And you know that portends a good time. And we had a good time, and they took about 50 or 60 of us to dinner. And oh, they had prepared. It was wonderful. And after everyone was about through eating, my wife and I sat at our table just being thankful when a young lady, and I believe she was a fine Christian young woman, she had been busy helping with the serving, and now that the pressure was off, she came out of the area where she was working, and she sat down at my table, and she said to me, Pastor Brooks, I want to tell you what your trouble is. Honestly, I, I began to chuckle. This was incredible. 
And I think she caught it, and so she added these words. I don't mean just you, but your group, your peers, the older men. She said, your problem is you're too uptight, too rigid, too stiff. Too orthodox. By this time, I was almost laughing out loud. I said, young lady, do you know me? My wife is there. Ask her if we're stiff, rigid. I don't like what Satan is trying to do. He wants to turn the old heads against the youth and the younger ones against the old heads. But God said in Malachi, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, I will send Elijah, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. There's going to be a coming together and understanding. But Satan wants you to feel we're against you. And wants us to feel you're against us. I refuse. There are things that I know. I heard the preacher say it. I know that I know that I know. And one of them is that I love the Lord. And I love my sweetheart. And I love my family. And I love God's church. And I love the young people of this church. I know that. Now, I make no apologies for proclaiming the truth. That's what I was called to do. And woe is me if I don't do it. I must do it, and you must too, for these are serious times in which we live. And I might as well tell you, I don't mind being called orthodox. If the person calling me that would first look up the word. I've got a dictionary in my office. It's about 10 inches thick. And laboring over this idea of talking to ordinance, I, I went and turned to orthodox. And the first word is simply orthodox. Or, or tho. You like to know what those mean? It means straight, right, true, bearing fruit, upright, high. Oh, I don't mind if you call me orthodox. But when I got down to the word, I found something interesting. Orthodoxy means corrected. Orthodoxy means to have a right opinion. And to correct errors. I got to thinking that if you have knee problems and hip problems, you need an orthopedic surgeon. If your teeth are so independent that each one wants to turn its own way, you need an orthodontist. If your feet are flat and you're leaving bear tracks in the sand, Dr. Scholl has products called orthotics. Slip them in your shoes, correct your problem. (laughs) 
But then the dictionary came to a spiritual meaning. It says, conformity to doctrines. I am holding a true standard as long as that standard is congruous with scriptural doctrine. That's me. Well, I just wish I could do it better. A corrective. But here's how I like correctives that are aimed at me. I don't mind you bringing them, but I want them smothered with grace. I want you to cut me some slack. <laughs> I want you to be humble about it. And then bring it on. When God made Adam and Eve, there was orthodoxy. Of all the trees you may freely eat, except one, the day you eat it, you surely die. Don't even touch it. That was orthodoxy. And then there came shattering hopelessness and fear. For man had disobeyed God. And in the cool of the evening along came God. And please notice, he never changed his word. But he smothered it with grace. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, thy seed and hers. Through her seed, your head will be crushed. Adam and Eve, it's not over. By grace, you can be saved. That in the day remains. And I, like you, see problems in my own church. But I want to tell you something. You cannot enjoy apostasy until either your conscience is seared and trampled in the mud, or you make a U-turn and come right back to the orthodoxy of Seventh-day Adventists. So there are things social and moral and spiritual amongst us that need a corrective. And God has promised one, and he's been consistent with this. How many times do I think about the flood in Noah's day? God had a straight message, and the people had departed from it until nearly every soul was about to be lost. And God said to Noah, build an ark for the saving of whoever wills to be saved. Noah was chosen, and he was orthodox. For 120 years, his message was consistently the same. He didn't change. He didn't compromise. He didn't soften it. Here it is. For 120 years, he was belittled, mocked, some thought he was dim-witted. He got on people's nerves. He refuted their dogmas, disputed their greatest minds. He debated their scientists. He rattled the theology departments of their universities. He wrecked their philosophies. He condemned their immorality. But above all, he built an ark. <laughs> Faith was a part of his message. Salvation, the greater part of his message. Survival, life. That's what he talked about. And then he said, Whosoever will, let him come. Come aboard. Come and help me in this. You don't have to pay any fare or any fee. I 
unloaded all of my property and put the means into building this boat. So you can come. Come. Then there was the day that the animals came. The clean ones by sevens, the unclean. Oh yeah, a pig or two got on board. But the smart Alex didn't get it. Ellen White says, you can, through repeated transgression, come to the place where you cannot see. It's hardly a matter of choice anymore. They didn't get it. And they moved away from Noah, laughing at his orthodoxy. But didn't it rain, children? Rain all night long. Forty days, forty nights without stopping. Didn't it rain? There are things that I think about that are incredible. And I am incredulous. I never dreamed in my wildest dreams that I would see a black man and his beautiful family in the White House. I never dreamed in my wildest dreams that I and my brothers would have to defend Adventism before Adventists. As one blessed to do evangelism, we took that on in the public arena. And thousands were better. But now our biggest opposition seems to come from where they are. And if you don't like it, you are a conservative. And that's supposed to be negative. I remember about 30 years ago addressing a human relations seminar, and I pointed out that conservatism is a euphemism for racism. Now it has another meaning. I was with Earl Cleveland one day, and a young theologue ran up to him to proclaim to this preacher of righteousness that the place where Israel crossed the sea was not the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. <laughs> Earl said, what's that mean? The water was only ankle deep. Now Earl had a mind as quick as that, and I'll never forget his answer. He said, oh my, I just learned something new. A bigger miracle than I first thought. Pharaoh's army got drowned in ankle deep water. When I was six months old, my mother was in the hospital and she had a vision. And God told her in that vision that he wanted her to obey his commandments and keep the Sabbath. It's almost strange that he didn't tell her how, but he surely told her why. When I was six years old, the Mount Carmel Methodist Episcopal Church organized a committee and sent them to our house to save Mother and her children. I was six years old. I wasn't going to miss a bit of this. Now, it might help the story for you to understand we'd never heard of y'all. We had no books, no papers, no teachers, no nothing. But Mother studied her Bible. And when the chairman of the committee began to talk about how God's commandments are done away with and you don't have to regard them, you don't have to even think about them, my mother wouldn't argue, she would question. And she said, sir, if that's true, then what does this text mean? And she read from the Bible that 
where there is no law, there is no transgression. And she taught that with 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. The committee stammered. And then Mother said this, and I chuckle today. She said, Mr. Holt, you know that beautiful lamp you have in your living room? One day while you are out, I'll just come over and steal it. <laughs> and if there is no law, The committee soon was confounded, got up to leave, and handed Mother a gift. I opened it. The Great Controversy by Ellen White. Four years later, Brother Willie White knocked on my sister's door. He was the call for her. And he wanted to canvass her. But my sister, less like mother and more like me, said to him, Sir, I don't want to embarrass you in my house, but I really don't care to hear what you say. Brother White said, Did I offend you? No, it's not that, she said. I'm just tired of Christians disobeying God. He said, Well, what do you mean? She said, We go traipsing off to church on the first day of the week. That is not the Sabbath. He said, then what day is? She said, seventh day is the Sabbath. Saturday. Finally, a smile broke across his face. And he said, sister, how would you like to go to a church where well, everybody believes that? I got home from school, 10 years old. This was Thursday in November, 1940. The next day, the pastor was at our home. The next day, my mother, six sisters, and I were in church. The very next day. I remember looking around. It wasn't impressive. Didn't have any padded seats or carpet on the floor. But over the pulpit were the Ten Commandments. And I remember at 10 years of age reading them and saying, This is it. And in all these years, I hadn't changed my mind one that little church had about ten young people. Amongst them was Dr. Faye Smith Davis, who spent so many years here at Oakwood College. She was a kid up in the choir line. Ralph P.A., president of South Atlantic Conference, sitting up there in the choir line. That's where I met them. I was in the church. Now, believe me, folks needed some orthodoxy. And my family needed some. The pastor had announced the baptism coming up. Oh, man, we all thought, we're going to be baptized into the church. And he kept saying, wait. And we didn't get it. What do you mean, wait? We've waited all these years. What do you mean, wait? And finally, that man was kind enough and wise enough to lay a little orthodoxy on Mother and the rest of us. Now, he had visited our farm, and when he came, even though my dad wasn't into this at all, he liked the pastor. The pastor liked him. They were friends. And when he came out that first time, he got the grand tour. He saw two of the finest horses you've ever seen. He saw cows. He saw chickens. And he saw pigs. And I was right there listening. And that pastor complimented my daddy's pigs. That, that was all right. God made them too. We wanted to be baptized. Didn't want any waiting. And as Mother kept pressing the pastor gently, he said to her, Sister Brooks, and I'm sitting right there, Sister Brooks, there are things you don't know yet. Like what? Mother had been a Christian all her life. 
My granddaddy was a Methodist preacher. My uncles were Methodist preachers. My oldest brother-in-law was a Methodist preacher. I come from a line of Methodist preachers, and they were good people. And now the pastor says, there's some things you don't know yet. Like what? Your temple, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God said if you defile it, God will destroy you. Now, Sister Brooks, you eat pork. Oh, yeah. Three times a day. And he began to tell her about that. And her mother said, Pastor, show me that. He turned the Bible around, Deuteronomy 14, Leviticus, and he read it to her while she read it. Now, orthodoxy is driving us away. Orthodoxy is a club that's invented in the minds of people who want to do other than as God is saying. I was there. When he laid it out, Mother said, All right, what else? He said, Why, Sister Brooks, God wants you to represent him in your appearance. There are some things that you don't understand yet. And he read from Isaiah 3 and then over to Timothy and Peter. And when he finished reading it, she said, All right, what else? A little orthodoxy, please. In the kindest way, he led us step by step into the remnant church style. And every time he came up with one, which meant a change or denial on our parts, the answer was all right. None of them were objectionable to us. The answer was, what else? What else? Now, I ought to tell you, I had seven sisters. And they were fairly nice looking, and one was especially so. Her husband was in the Navy and was overseas. And when she heard about appearance, uh, I'm coming home now. When she heard about appearance and superfluous adornings, I said superfluous adornings. Don't try to engage me in an argument because I wear a watch. And that sister said, no, this is where I get off. My husband saw me last looking like this. I expect when he comes home, he'll want to see me looking like this. Nobody argued with her. Six months later, she was baptized and became a winner of souls amongst professionals. Now, all this was strange to us. The biggest noise comes now from folk brought up in the church. I have gone to places called pagan. And their hearts and arms are open to the truth. God will not take that lightly. For to whom much is given, much is required. Right away we learned that we were joining a special church with a special message. And gladly would we conform. My mother died. In 1959, and now there's a whole tribe of descendants. Nearly every single one of them a member of this church. No ordinary church. My dad took a lot longer. But I remember a little thing. She came home one day. He was a big, tough man, hard worker, good appetite, and like all of us husbands, you see the pots on the stove and you wonder what's the dinner, so you take a peek. I never forget, he looked in there and string beans. Looked in that one, string beans. And I remember him saying, Hun, what is this? You got two pots of string beans. Oh, she said, These are for you. 
And these are for the rest of us. You can't force orthodoxy. My dad said, what is that supposed to be? She said, yours are cooked with pork. These are in new pots cooked with vegetable oil. <laughs> My dad said, you don't have to do that for me. I'll eat like you eat. It, w- it wasn't the other way around. I will come over here. If you stand for something, somebody will stand with you. Would you believe that amongst us, we now have problems with the doctrines that made us a peculiar people? Do you have any idea how fast this church is growing by the grace of God? There wasn't a million when I came in. Today we are approaching 19 million. They're being baptized at more than a million a year. Ellen White says thousands will be baptized in a day. And we in America and Europe and Australia are so arrogant we think that means us. It's happening now. The Lord is finishing His work. Now you got a right to argue with the doctrines. I'm not trying to take anything away from you. But before you throw them away, you better study them. And see if you can ascertain whether a gloomy committee of old conservatives made them up. Or are they literally the Word of God? Now, if they are the Word of God, you got something else to deal with. God says, I change not. Don't try to modernize him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is not going to say, wait a minute, maybe I made a mistake here. No, no, no. No, 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 no. I was blessed to do evangelism. And in the very first staff meeting I would have, there's a point I always made. Ellen White says in the book Evangelism, one soul. How many? One soul is worth more than the whole world. Now, if you want something really remarkable, read Gospel Workers. There she says, one soul is worth more than many works. Why would I want to make that clear to my staff? Because I'm not going to be shackled and hung up on numbers. I'm not going to baptize three-year-olds just to have a number. And I'm not going to be discouraged if I don't baptize 150 every time. If the Lord delivers one soul, then I will praise the Lord. I'd rather have one soul baptized who understands the truth and is willing to do it than to have than to have a mega church full of unfortunate souls who don't know what they stand for. And then we hear, and then we hear in our churches, well, all we want to do is praise you. I got no problem with that. But you need to know Ellen White says obedience is the highest praise. <laughs> Beloved friends, we forget who the example is supposed to be. We're not better than other people who go to church on other days. We're not as good as some. But what God declares he would have is a remnant church, a model. 
so that if he reaches somebody who doesn't know anything about the Sabbath or the 2300 days or anything else, they will say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? He's supposed to point them to you and to me. And we are supposed to represent him. There are things I say, you, you men who are going to be ordained, please understand the spirit in which I say these things. If any one of you is talented above your brethren, exciting to watch, full of drawing charisma, it's possible for you to set a peg and Adventists will come from all over town and join your church. And you might go around boasting, I got the biggest church in town. Let me tell you, that's not church growth. I, I had a Baptist preacher friend in Cleveland, and we were having a talk one day. He said, what's the problem I have with you? You steal my sheep. I said, Pastor, steal some of mine. You can have all you can... Convince? We keep this stuff up, we're going to bring so much of the world in, we will lose our identity. And what we seem to be after more than anything else is not truth, but something easy. Those who are always talking down the spirit of prophecy haven't read it. Folk are down on what they're not up on. And that is a problem. And the crowd will never be without criticism. Jesus was called a wine bibber because he hobnobbed with sinners. Thank the Lord. He hobnobbed with sinners. Yeah. Thank God for that. But he was always orthodox when he met with these sinners. The saints in the church complain that Simon's house, Simon the leper, whom Jesus had cured, had a feast for him, and this woman came in with the alabaster box, and she had a dark bag. And of all people, Simon knew it. And he said, Judas was complaining on this, Simon over here, he said, if this man were really a prophet, he didn't know what kind of woman they were. And Jesus read his thoughts. And then he said, Simon, I have somewhat to say. I really, that's what my sermon is about today. I have somewhat to say. And especially to these young preachers. You are last day preachers. And so, Simon got a rebuke. I suppose the one who loved, who was forgiven the most, will love the most. And the servant of the Lord says, Simon and Judas got a earful without being exposed. Simon and Judas, a dose of orthodoxy. From the Son of God. These are awful times. Some things are spiritually discerned, and there are people sitting out there who don't get a thing I'm saying. I used to get upset over that. I thought I'd feel somewhere. But then I remember two men came to my meeting in Chicago, and one of them was sitting here, and his buddy was sitting there. And when I would preach, this one would rejoice, this one was mad as a wet head. Now, I said to myself, I didn't preach two sermons. So the problem ain't my sermon, it's the substance that receives it. I came to this campus in 1947. You ought to talk to me about how it looked then. But it was the most wonderful place I had ever been. Amen. I had just turned 17, had never gotten homesick in my life. Never complained about the food in my life. Glad to be here. 1947. But World War II had just ended recently. 
and the atomic age was born, and the world was full of tension and fear. They published a clock few minutes to midnight. The impression was we might all go up in smoke pretty soon. And then we came down here, and all of a sudden, Korea is about to explode. And a bunch of us had a meeting together. I don't think it was a call meeting. And we began to talk. And this is what we were saying. Why are we here? If the end is so near, why are we here? Maybe we ought to leave and go out and just do the best we can. And there was a beautiful and wise woman on the faculty, Dr. Natelka Barrett. She heard about us and sent for us. And with a smile and being completely at ease, she opened up the spirit of prophecy and began to read. Ellen White says, God will give you credit for the souls you might have won. He will judge you by your application to, stu to study, by your faithfulness while you're a student, she said, fellas, don't worry about that. Go on back to your classes and get yourself ready. Sixty-three years later, he had gone. But don't tell me the vision has failed. That's unorthodox. Don't, don't bring me that. I got an announcement today. He is coming. But then the Bible says there will be another excuse. Why, since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were. Listen, my own father died in 1968 at 82 years of age, and all things are not even now as he had seen since my daddy died. My daddy never saw 911. My daddy never learned the word tsunami that carried away 250,000 people in one stroke. My daddy didn't witness the second collapse of an economy. My daddy never saw Obama in the White House. My daddy had signs and wonders that no generation except our own has seen. My daddy didn't hear about the oil spill and what that portends. You know, doctors have told some of their patients not to watch the news. Too depressing. And folks don't know what to do. If they knew, they'd do it. You gonna have to trust God now, one way or the other. And soon comes the intensified shaking of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and the Lord's service says thousands will leave. Oh my! Oh, but it doesn't end there. She said, when they leave, thousands will come in and take their places. And I love this. She said, the ranks of the Lord's army will not be diminished. Let's say amen out there. You think I'm hanging my head over that? There are these anomalies, both social and spiritual. Insecurity is driving the world into union. The Bible says, three unclean spirits like frogs out of the mouth of the prophet. That's the false prophet. And out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the dragon. And we are seeing it. But you say, how could that happen? How can it possibly be that these desperate groups will be brought into union? It has already been written down. I have a picture of the Pope, and with him an imam, and with them a Catholic rabbi, uh, 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 Jewish rabbi. And they have agreed to Sunday closings. Now, don't you tell me for a minute that Jew believes the Sunday is sacred. It's not about that. It's about the economy, and it's about world peace. And the Lord's servant says it will appear to be about patriotism. And there's one little group that says we can't join. Aha! Uh -huh, you're not patriotic. And thousands will come saying, let's do something about these folks. And there will be a great host who say, we know how to kill for God. We did that during the Dark Ages. We will show you. 
Now, what you going to do? They are saying, as the man who was beaten by the cop said, can't we all just get along? <laughs> but there are extrapolations, sprouting osophies, allergies, and isms, some of which you've not even heard yet. There is a man who preaches to 50,000 people every week. He said he was on Good Morning America. Finally, the interviewer said to him, please, what are the doctrines you teach? What are the tenets of your faith? Oh, he said, we don't bother with that. We just want people to feel good about themselves. That's precisely what God doesn't want. When the Spirit comes, He brings conviction. He will convince the world of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness. It begins with us being uncomfortable with ourselves and going to the only source of peace one who can really help us. These false prophets we're talking about are now preaching the second coming of Christ. One group says it'll be 2011. The other group said, oh, no, we have it on good authority. It'll be 2012. And the Bible says, the Bible says, and the Bible says, many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And it's possible for an ordained Seventh-day Adventist preacher to refuse orthodoxy and become listed with the false prophets. And some of them are going to be very impressive, even calling down fire from heaven in the sight of men. I didn't know it would take this long to do with them. Doing up here. But the Bible says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. The word hypocrite comes from a Greek word which means actor. We're just putting on a show. And in some of our churches, that's what it is. Oh, you shout, you get your praise on. But what day is the Sabbath? Don't know. How are you supposed to adorn yourself? Don't know. Haven't gotten to that yet. Something's going on. And I want to tell you something. I almost heard it this morning, but I jotted it down here a week or two ago. Pied payers and Sabbath keepers crucified Jesus. And so you ordinance. Yes, you. In this age of unthinkable technology, be all you can be. Get something going on for Jesus and all this foolishness will dissipate like dew before the morning sun. Somebody comes to you, a baptized member who should have settled this before they were baptized, and they want to question the standards and rules and doctrines of God, put them to work! They shut their mouths. God did not allow television to be developed just for Saturday Night Live and after hours pornography. You won't watch it anyhow and use it. I was on for 25 years and I can't go anywhere in the world that somebody doesn't remember we were on. Go to the radio. It is still a powerful force. Get something going on. Glorify God, not yourself. Glorify God and prepare a people for the coming of our Lord. Do not, hey, I repeat it, do not weaken the force of God's remnant church. That's a danger to you. You cannot bear that. Lift up Jesus. Oh, you see, I repeat the same things the liberals say. Lift up Jesus. I'm okay with that. All they got to do is accept Christ. I believe that. But there's more to it. The Bible says if you accept him, you ought to walk as he walked. Now, how did he walk? The Bible says in Luke 4, he went to church on the Sabbath as a custom. Would you say amen? John 
14, 15, he said, I have kept my father's commandments. He either told the truth or he didn't. I believe he told the truth because he is the truth. How did he walk? He was kind and loving and full of hope. Sometimes he had to get rough on those rascals. But Ellen White says even when he used those words excoriating the Jewish leaders, there were tears in his voice. How did he walk? He did not commit sin. Even the devil who followed him around couldn't point to one sin. He was humble. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I want to tell you as I close all of this, he's coming. He's coming soon. The heavens are going to split wide open. The sun is going to go out like a light, a light on your night table. And the earth will come forth. And out of some central area will come peals of thunder from the silver trumpet of God like a laser beam from heaven. From infinity to infinity, it will wake up the dead. Billions of hearts asleep will be jump started. I imagine you can hear the thump, 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 thump as these hearts spring to life. You can hear it all over God's creation. Thank God for a special church. Thank God for a special message. You better be careful what you do with it.